transmit speech and music instead of simple pulses, you first have to convert the sound to an electrical signal with a microphone and then combine it with uh, the radio waves. In the radio receiver, it all gets separated out again. You can see this very clearly on an oscilloscope. If I turn on this little radio, and I now plug the oscilloscope in to the loudspeaker, well, it's a bit, a bit large. This is giving a picture of the sound signal, and you can see it roughly matches the sound that's coming out of the loudspeaker. Now, if I plug it in further back on the circuit, uh, this is the sound signal combined with the radio waves. You can see the peaks still roughly match the sound that it's making, and the radio waves are actually going rapidly up and down in the middle. Now if I stretch this out a bit, these are the actual radio waves, and you can see what's happening is that the sound is constantly changing their size or their amplitude. And that's why this is called amplitude modulation, or AM radio. The man who designed much of the practical circuitry for AM radio was an American called Edwin Howard Armstrong. While in France during World War I, he invented the superhet circuit which has been used ever since. He then sold a patent to RCA back in America. I have an appointment to see Mr. Sarnoff. Oh, Mr. Sarnoff's expecting you, Mr. Armstrong. Thanks. You're welcome. He became a millionaire overnight and fell in love with the chairman's hey, secretary. Uh, how about you come for a spin in my motor? Okay. Hop in there. Oh, it sure is a big one. He bought a huge Hispano Suiza and climbed his tallest aerial to impress her. They were married soon afterwards. Will you marry me? Oh, Howard, my hero. The fundamental principles of radio have remained unchanged. This is the BBC transmitter at Brookman's Park, broadcasting medium wave radio to South East England. Inside, the engineers have restored the BBC's very first transmitter, built by the Marconi Company in about 1920. This end of it actually creates the radio waves, and this end of it combines them with the sound signal, the amplitude modulation. It's basically a series of giant tuned circuits with uh, the valves, the coils of wire of the inductors, and uh, the overlapping metal plates of the capacitors. Well, this uh, generates about two kilowatts. This may sound a lot, but um, this modern transmitter is rated 150 kilowatts, and it's all much more sophisticated. This one's actually broadcasting Radio 3 on AM all over South East England. Inside, though, the basic components are still remarkably similar. The inductors have remained exactly the same, and the valves and capacitors, although they're now more enclosed, still work on the same principles as well. Transmitters like these broadcasting sound first appeared in World War I. They were used for sending messages by radio telephony. Broadcasting radio to entertain people was first started after the war by enthusiastic Marconi engineers. Much of the radio set's evolution has been preserved by Gerald Wells at the Vintage Wireless Museum. If you wanted something better than a crystal set, what sort of thing would you have had? Well, you could have had something like this, which is three separate units, hence it was called a wireless or radio set, because it was a set of parts. It would have consisted of a tuned circuit, an RF amplifier, a detector stage, and a power output stage. And that would have got you most of the local stations with earphones or a modest loudspeaker. What, what happened after that was the next stage? That well, the next the stage, they decided to stick it all in one box to make it less wires and to make it neater. And this was a bit more elaborate as well. More stations were coming onto the airwaves, so more elaborate tuning was needed. So they brought in a series parallel switching for your aerials and tuned circuits, variable condenser and reaction condenser, an RF stage to amplify the signal, detector stage to take the place of the old-fashioned cat's whisker, and two stages of LF amplification. That would be quite an elaborate set, but you could, by moving these bars around, 
do away with those stages and listen with earphones on there and save a lot of battery power. Oh, I see. When, when do they start enclosing all, all the working parts of the radios? Well, certainly by the mid-twenties, when uh, they decided that this wasn't really very nice in the living room, and so they started building it into familiar objects, uh, like the medicine chest, for instance, uh, where it could be easily disguised, and that wouldn't disgrace any respectable home. What other shapes? Really? Well, the most famous of all, of course, is the smoker's cabinet. Every home had a smoker's cabinet. You'd have a, your pipe racks and the bits at the top. It was smoking was big industry. You'd have your drawer at the bottom, where you'd have your pipe cleaners and your matches and your tobacco. And it would all fold away and look quite innocent. It didn't scream wireless at you. Of course, all these early radios were powered by batteries, weren't they? Well, yes, sir. There was very little electricity around. And the early radios required a two-volt accumulator, sometimes four or six, but usually two, which had to be charged up every week. So that meant you had two of them, one being charged, one in use. And you'd need a high-tension battery, and you'd need a grid bias battery. The grid they... bias battery lasted about a year and cost nine pence. Mm. That would last about three months and cost you seven and sixpence. So it was all quite expensive then? Wasn't it was an expensive business and it took a lot of rigging up. You had to have an elaborate aerial and earth system yeah. and all the bother of getting your accumulator charged every week. Admitted it was only fruitless, reasonably cheap, but it did mean you had to be careful. You had about 20 hours listening a week. So that when you went to your radio shop, there was usually a Radio Times provided on the counter. That saved you buying one. And with the aid of VF Bakelite fountain pen and a pad, you could make notes of what was worth listening to during the following week. So you could pick your programmes and plan your meals around the wireless set. You didn't just hear it, you actually sat down and listened to it and gave it all your attention. You had to, it would cost you so much to rig up. And of course, when you came in with your accumulator every week, there was all the other old uh, tabbers and rat bags in there changing the accumulators as well, and you would discuss the programmes. So the reputation of wireless programmes was made and lost in a wireless shop. By the 30s, the appearance of radios had started to change dramatically with the introduction of the new material, Bakelite. Pioneered in Britain by the Echo Company, this could be moulded to almost any shape. Its one drawback was that it was easily breakable. See these two portable radios? Well, watch this. Let her go, Betsy. Sorry, friend. You old-style portables have to go. But look at our new RCA Victor portable radio. Came through without a chip. RCA Victor's non-breakable impact case means no chipping, no cracking, breaking. And hear that tone. It's RCA Victor's great golden throat sound. See the world's only portables with the non-breakable impact case as low as $27.95 at your RCA Victor dealer.